Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us. Today, we are honored to have Kate Moore presenting The Radium Girls, the story of America's shining women. My name is Cassandra Carlson and I will be hosting the webinar on the back end. This webinar is approximately 45 minutes, followed by a Q&A session. Moderating for us today is Dr. Susan M. Bailey. Dr. Susan Bailey is a professor of radiation cancer biology in the Department of Environmental and Radiological Health Sciences at Colorado State University in Fort Collins, Colorado. She is the immediate past president of the Radiation Research Society. Dr. Bailey also serves as director of CSU's Program of Research and Scholarly Excellence in Cancer Biology and Comparative Oncology. As one of the principal investigators in the NASA Twin Study, Dr. Bailey's research efforts have demonstrated the importance of assessing telomere length dynamics and DNA damage responses associated with the unique stresses and chronic exposures experienced by astronauts living and working in the extreme environment of space. And I'll hand it over to Dr. Bailey to introduce Kate Moore. Thank you so much, Cassandra. It's indeed a pleasure and an honor this morning to introduce our speaker, Kate Moore, who will be introducing us to the American women from the 1920s who were poisoned by the radium paint they worked with painting watch dials and who courageously fought for justice. In her talk, Ms. Moore takes us behind the scenes into her research and writing process for her New York Times bestselling book, The Radium Girls, The Dark Story of America's Shining Women, where she showcases the strength, sisterhood, and extraordinary legacy of these very special women. Kate Moore is the New York Times and USA Today bestselling author of The Radium Girls, which won the 2017 Goodreads Choice Award for Best History, was voted US Librarian's favorite nonfiction book of 2017, and was named a notable nonfiction book of 2018 by the American Library Association. Kate Moore is a British writer based in London, where she writes across a variety of genres and has multiple titles on the New York Times bestselling list. Kate conducted a large amount of research for the book for Radium Girls and was amazed to discover that really no book had ever focused on the women themselves and their personal stories. Feeling passionately that they deserved such a book, Kate decided to write it. Her research took her 4,000 miles across an ocean to follow the women's footsteps. She stood at the sites of the dial painting studios, visited the women's homes, and graves and met their families and remembered the Radium Girls. And she hopes through her book and through talks like this that readers will do the same. So with that, and also a sincere thank you to the Radiation Research Society History Committee for making this webinar possible. And with a warm welcome to Kate Moore, it's a pleasure to welcome her and to thank everyone for joining us today. Kate, we're really looking forward to your presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Bailey, and thank you everyone for joining us. I'm so excited to be with you here today talking about the Radium Girls, because it's my passion to speak about them. These women were absolutely extraordinary, and it's my privilege to talk to you about them today. I've written their stories in this book, The Radium Girls, and I actually want to start today's presentation by just reading a very short extract from the book, because I'm a little nervous today talking to you because I'm definitely not a scientist. I have none of the expertise that Dr. Bailey was just described as having. I'm very much a lay person coming to this story. And what I hope the extract from this book shows is how I've chosen to talk to you about them. And that is to think of them not as subjects of this incredible scientific discovery of which they were part, but instead to think of them as people and as women people with personalities, with personal triumphs and tragedies. And I hope that you through this talk and that readers through my book will walk in step with these real people and go on this journey with them. So without further ado, let's get started. I'm going to read from chapter one, which always seems a good place to start. Our setting is Newark in New Jersey and the year is 1917. Catherine Sharp had a jaunty spring in her step as she walked the brief four blocks to work. It was February 1st, 1917, but the cold didn't bother her one bit. 
she had always loved the winter snows of her hometown. The frosty weather wasn't the reason for her high spirits on that particular icy morning though. Today, she was starting a brand new job at the watch dial factory of the Radium Luminous Materials Corporation based on 3rd Street in Newark, New Jersey. It was one of her close pals who had told her about the vacancy. Catherine was a lively, sociable girl with many friends. As she herself later recalled, a friend of mine told me about the watch studio where watch dial numerals and hands were painted with a luminous substance that made them visible in the dark. The work she explained was interesting and a far higher type than the usual factory job. It sounded so glamorous, even in that brief description. After all, it wasn't even a factory, but a studio. For Catherine, a girl who had a very imaginative temperament, it sounded like a place where anything could happen. She was an attractive girl of just 14. Her 15th birthday was in five weeks time. Standing just under five foot four, she was a very pretty little blonde with twinkling blue eyes, fashionably bobbed hair and delicate features. All her life, Popular Science later wrote, Catherine Sharp had cherished the desire to pursue a literary career. She was certainly go-getting. She later wrote that after her friend had given her word of the opportunities at the watch studio. I went to the man in charge and asked for a job. And that was how she found herself outside the factory on Third Street, knocking on the door and gaining admittance to the place where so many young women wanted to work. She felt almost a little starstruck as she was ushered through the studio and saw the dial painters turning diligently to their tasks. The girls sat in rows, dressed in their ordinary clothes and painting dials at top speed, their hands almost a blur to Catherine's uninitiated eyes. Each had a flat wooden tray of dials beside her, but it wasn't the dials that caught Catherine's eye. It was the material they were using. It was the radium. Radium, well, it was a wonder element. Everyone knew that. Catherine had read all about it in magazines and newspapers, which were forever extolling its virtues and advertising new radium products for sale. But they were all far too expensive for a girl of Catherine's humble origins. She had never seen it up close before. It was the most valuable substance on earth, selling for $120,000 for a single gram, that's $2.2 million in today's values. To her delight, it was even more beautiful than she had imagined. Even as she watched, little puffs of it seemed to hover in the air before settling on the shoulders or hair of a dial painter at work. To her astonishment, it made the girls themselves gleam. They were using slim, camel hair brushes with narrow wooden handles. Yet as fine as the brushes were, the bristles had a tendency to spread, hampering the girls' work. They had to make the brushes even finer. And there was only one way they knew of to do that. We put the brushes in our mouths, Catherine said, quite simply. But of course, it wasn't simple at all. And that's why I'm standing before you today, talking to you about the Radium Girls, because that seemingly innocent and innocuous act of putting a paintbrush laden with radioactive radium paint between her lips led Catherine Sharp and all the other Radium Girls down a path they could never have anticipated following. It led them down a path where they became poster girls for workers' rights, 
It led them down a path where they became unwitting guinea pigs in a journey of scientific discovery. And it led them down a path where these ordinary women achieved extraordinary things. And yet, so many people have never heard of them. So who were the Radium Girls? Well, Catherine Sharp is actually a very typical example. So they were young, 14, 15, 16 years of age, but actually records show that some of them were as young as 11. And they came from poor immigrant working class families. Dial painting was actually known as the elite job for the poor working girls. And that was for several reasons. Number one was the money. It was an incredibly lucrative profession if you were good at it. The girls were paid by the number of dials that they painted every day. And the most skilled workers found themselves in the top 5% of female wages earners nationally. They earn more than three times the average factory floor worker. So that a time before women even had the votes, these young women were earning more than their fathers at times, sometimes even more than their husbands if they had them. But the money wasn't the only appeal. And in fact, another attraction of the job only became clear to me as I started my research into my book. I traveled to the girls' hometowns and looked them up in their local town directories. I traveled to a little town called Ottawa in Illinois, which is another dial painting center that I write about in the book. And I looked up a woman called Catherine Dunahue, one of the key radium girls. Her name was listed in her town directory and it listed her name, address and profession. But next to Catherine's name, it didn't say she was a dial painter. It said Catherine Dunahue, artist artist, Radium Dial Company. And I think that artistic nature of the job was another key attraction for the women in signing up to the studio. Let's not forget too the historic context of the time we're talking about. So Catherine Sharp was going to work in February 1917. Now the history buffs among you will know that just a few months later in April, America joined the First World War. And that led to a huge boom in the radium dial painting industry because the girls were not just painting watches and clocks with their glow in the dark paint. They were painting aeronautical instruments and things that would light up the dashboards of ships and planes and automobiles. So with the war effort came a huge explosion in the amount of dials and instruments that the girls needed to paint. And of course, many women were patriotically motivated to do their bit for their country. One such woman was Grace Fryer, another central figure in this story. Grace was an incredibly intelligent young woman. She was 18 when war was declared and actually already had a job that paid about the same as dial painting, but she left it to join the studio just four days after war was declared. She had two brothers who had gone to fight in France, and she too wanted to do her bit. One of the tragedies, the many tragedies of this story for me, is that when that wartime boom happened, the women who were lucky enough to have jobs in the studio then promoted these countless vacancies to those closest to them, their sisters and their cousins and their best friends, so that when what happened to the radium girls then happened. It wasn't just one daughter in a family who was affected, but two or three or four. But at the time, actually to be working with your sister and your cousin made for a fabulous place to work. So Grace Fryer got a job for her little sister, Adelaide, and Catherine Sharp introduced her cousin, Irene Rildolf, to the studio. And just imagine the social camaraderie of these times, working through the night, the studio operated seven days a week, and these women would be there. There was a huge sort of social bonhomie to the studio. There would be company picnics. I found photographs of them in the archives. Also snapshots of the girls sitting on a sort of rest break, sitting on a bench that ran across a brook, a little bridge that ran across a brook behind the studio, swinging their legs in the water and eating ice cream cones. 
and those friendships too continued after work. So Catherine Donahue in Illinois remembered that she and her friends used to wear their good dresses to the plant. And that was because the radium girls would get covered in the glowing dust from the radioactive radium paint as they worked. Catherine Jarb described in that opening chapter how it would settle on the shoulders of hair of a dial painter at work. So Catherine Donahue going to work in her party frock would also get covered in this glowing dust. And so you can just imagine the radium girls going out dancing after work in the speakeasies and music halls of the First World War and the Roaring Twenties. The radium girls being these shimmering fireflies on the dance floor, twirling and enjoying that glow that they had. They were so obvious as they walked home. It was actually a nickname that was generated for them. They were nicknamed the ghost girls because they would shine like spirits as they walked home through the dark streets of New Jersey and Illinois. But of course they embraced that glamour and that glow. The women talked about how they'd actually paint their fingernails with this radium paint or they'd even paint it onto their faces and then go in the dark room for a bit of a laugh, you know, a comedy moustache or a chin, a um, little bit in your eyebrows. One woman even painted her teeth with it for a smile that would glow in the dark. But these women had no fear of radium. In fact, that was probably the most compelling reason of all to join the studios, because as insane as it seems to us today, at the time we're talking about, Radium was not only seen as safe, but actually beneficial to health. If you went into your local drugstore, you could buy radium pills and dressings to treat a range of ailments, anything from constipation to hay fever. And actually, it wasn't just sold medicinally either. You could buy a range of radium lingerie to boost your sex life. And they also put it into butter and milk and chocolate and toothpaste. There was a whole industry that sprang up around it. People actually took radium as a kind of health tonic or vitamin to ward off ill health, to overcome fatigue and sort of banish that middle aged, uh, you know, fatigue that you would have to give them a sort of pep and a bounce so that people actually drank radium water, the recommended dose was five to seven glasses a day. But even though the radium girls lived in this world, they didn't accept that instruction from the companies to put the brushes in their mouths with blind faith. May Cubberley, another girl that I write about in the book who trained Catherine Sharp, she said when she was told to put the brush in her mouth, she said the first thing we asked was, does this stuff hurt you? She wanted to be sure. But her manager said that the women did not need to be afraid. They said it wasn't dangerous. But that wasn't quite true. My book actually opens not with chapter one that I read you earlier, but with a prologue dated 1901, 16 years before Catherine Sharp is going to work on that February day. And it opens with a scientist receiving a radiation burn from a vial of radium that he keeps in his waistcoat pocket. So actually, from the turn of the century, it was known that radium could damage human flesh and bone. And the fact that the radium companies knew it too can be seen in the shocking fact that in the laboratories next door to where the radium girls are dial painting and putting the brushes in their mouths, the lab workers in those laboratories are issued with safety equipment to protect them from the damage that radium could cause. They wore lead aprons and wielded ivory tipped tongs, so they were protected. So what was the difference other than gender between these two groups? Well, it was the amount of radium that they were handling. It was known that a large amount of radium could destroy human tissue, and yet a small amount was perceived to be safe and beneficial to health. But when you dig a little deeper into why people thought that, it turns out that the research that said a small amount was safe 
was funded and published by the radium companies themselves. Those people who were making money hand over fist, producing all these products and things. And so that's why people thought a small amount was safe because of this research. In fact, people died of radium poisoning before the first dial painter even picked up her brush. But there was another reason why people chose to believe the radium firms and did so with absolute enthusiasm and faith. It was because when it was discovered at the turn of the century that radium could destroy human tissue, people thought, well, how can we use that power? And it was directed at cancerous tumours with remarkable results. It was life-saving. And in fact, radium is so effective at treating cancer, but it's still used today. Now, when we saw these wonderful medicinal effects of cancer, people thought, how can we harness that power? How can we use it for greater good? And they thought, well, perhaps a small amount will give you that you know, boost that people were reading about in the magazines and the newspapers. And they were also interested because of the immense power of the radioactivity of the radium. So radium has a half-life of 1,600 years, meaning, as all of you on this call will know, that it doesn't diminish in that power for all those centuries. And so scientists and entrepreneurs wanted to try to harness that power. They actually thought, well, if radium can emanate its rays for all of that amount of time, perhaps we can use it to seek human immortality. Perhaps there's a way of consuming radium so that humans too will be that powerful for that many centuries. I actually found headlines in the Newark Evening News when I was doing my research from the 1920s, urging their readers to eat radium tablets because doing so, they said, would, and I quote, add years to our lives. This is what people thought was going to be happening. And so the radium girls thought they were absolutely blessed to be working with this miraculous substance. But of course, that wasn't the case at all. And as the years passed and time went by, the radium girls grew up, the war ended. But as the girls moved on with their lives, the radium went with them. And to explain what had happened to the women biomedically, it's important to know that radium is biomedically very similar to calcium. And as we all know, we're supposed to drink glasses of milk because the calcium in the milk will go into our bones and make them strong. Now, when Catherine and Grace consumed that radium from ingesting it through putting the brushes in their mouths, their bodies assessed this new substance that had been introduced and it thought, I know what to do with this. It's like calcium. I'll put it in their bones. Radium poisoning is a very insidious type of poisoning. It takes years to show itself. And in fact, when the girls started to suffer symptoms, it all seemed very innocent and innocuous at first. It would just be an aching tooth or a sore arm, perhaps a painful leg or an ache in a hip. Not too much to worry about. But Catherine Sharp, for example, who felt it first in a tooth, well, she went to a dentist to have that tooth pulled hoping that would be the end of the trouble. But then the next tooth started to hurt. And then the next tooth. And then the next. Until Catherine Sharp didn't have to go to the dentist anymore to have her teeth pulled because they simply fell out on their own. Other women found that their limbs would spontaneously fracture. Grace Fryer, when she went for an X-ray on her aching back, found that her vertebrae had been crushed by some invisible and mysterious power operating from the inside out, destroying her from the inside out. When they studied the women later, they found that their bones were honeycombed and moth-eaten in appearance. They literally had holes in them, holes that had been drilled there by the radium while the women were still alive. Just try to imagine, if you can, the pain that these women were in. Catherine Sharp tried to describe it once and she said the only thing she could compare it to was like a dentist drilling on a live nerve, minute after minute. 
hour after hour, day after day. Yet when these women went to their doctors, the doctors had no clue what was happening because all of the women were presenting different ailments and they were women. So often these women were dismissed despite the immense pain that they were in and they were sent home with aspirin, aspirin, when the radium was drilling holes in their bones. Their strength in the face of this suffering was quite extraordinary because what they did next is that those friendship groups that had brought them into the studios in the first place, well, those friendship groups now came into their own because even though no one in authority was joining the dots and connecting these occupational illnesses, well, the women talked to each other. They shared their stories of what was happening. And so Grace Fryer talked about her aching back. Catherine Sharp talked about her teeth. Catherine Donahue in Illinois described how she had a pain in her ankle, a pain that spread up through her leg, through her knee, until it settled in her hip. These women talked. And they realized, as Catherine Shah put it, that there was something going on about this thing. The women banded together and tried to fight for recognition. And it took them to do it because, to my horror and shock, as I was investigating this in the book, even though dozens of young women had died, no one in authority was taking any notice at all. No one in authority took notice until the first male employee of the radium firm died. He was the one to have the first autopsy. He was the one that proved that actually his work in the radium firm was killing the employees. Only after that did the women start to be studied and start to be helped. But even once these connections became clear, the companies refuse to admit responsibility. And what my book does is to chart what happens next as the Radium Girls embark on a landmark fight for justice. For me, what is ex so extraordinary about their story is not only that they did this while they're in the most immense physical pain imaginable, it's not only that they did it because they're taking on an extraordinarily powerful corporation, someone that has, you know, millions of dollars worth of contracts, someone that has government contacts so that these companies tried everything they could to silence these women, to stop this connection coming out, to make sure, as they hoped, that the radium industry would not come crashing down around these ears because of what these women were saying. Even though the women were fighting against that and fighting against this company, for me, what is so extraordinary about their battle is the altruism of it. Because there was no hope for these women. Once radium is in your skeleton, it's in your skeleton. There's no way to get it out. And there was no money either. And to illustrate that, I just want to share with you one settlement that I uncovered in my research for the book. It was a settlement offered to the widow of a radium girl who had died. Mildred Cardo was her name, and she died aged 22, just six months after getting married. And the sum of money that the company offered to her new husband for his wife's death was $43.75. So there was no money and there was no hope. And yet these women still battled on, determined to hold the companies to account. And one of my favourite quotes in the book comes from Grace Fryer. And she's asked when she's filing suit, why are you doing it? And she says, it is not for myself that I care. I am thinking more of the hundreds of other girls to whom this may serve as an example. And I think the Radium Girls are an example to us all. They're an example of what you can achieve when you band together with like-minded people and you fight for what you believe in. They're an example that no matter how powerless you may feel, no matter how small your voice may seem, you can make a difference because these women literally changed the world. Their landmark legal fight brought about changes in legislation to protect millions of other workers. But even beyond that, the scientific gift that they gave the world in agreeing to be studied medically for the rest of their lives and even afterwards has given the world an immense gift of knowledge. 
And in fact, that gift stretched well into the 20th century. Think about the Manhattan Project, workers, you know, manipulating new radioactive materials, not really knowing what the damage may be. The lead scientist on the Manhattan Project wrote in his diary that as he was walking through the labs of the Manhattan Project one night, he had a sudden vision, a memory of the radium girls. A memory that would not have been there had these women not filed suit and brought it to public attention. And because of that memory of the radium girls and what they suffered, he insisted that research be conducted on the Manhattan Project to find out the potential biomedical problems. And in fact, they discovered that the uranium was biomedically very similar to the radium and therefore protective measures were put in place to protect the workers, all thanks to the radium girls, because he didn't want what had happened to the women to happen to his workers. Even after that, after the Second World War, we're going into the 1950s, there's a nuclear arms race going on. Well, at this point, we've got above ground atomic tests happening and that radioactive fallout is coming back down to Earth. Well, scientists want to investigate it to know if it's a problem that it's getting into the human food chain and so on. Well, who can they ask for help? The radium girls. They were studied for decades and partly thanks to those studies on the women, President Kennedy signed the Limited Test Ban Treaty, which in my opinion, literally saved the world because it prohibited those tests and it stopped that radioactive fallout that was damaging people across the globe. So what an extraordinary legacy they've left us. And yet so many people have never heard of the Radium Girls. And you may be wondering how I, a British author, came to their story as well. Well, I didn't know anything about them either. And my journey with these women was so serendipitous. One afternoon in the spring of 2014, I was sat on my sofa in London and I was looking for a new play to direct. I googled great plays for women. And one of the plays that came back was a play called These Shining Lives by Melanie Marnich about the Ottawa dial painters, Catherine Wolfe, Dunahue and Pearl Payne and the other women from that centre. The moment I found this script, I fell in love with the story and with the women. I didn't even read the full script. I read just the opening monologue that I found online. And I turned to my husband and I said, this is the play I have to direct next. Something about this story of real women fighting for their rights was universal in its power and it spoke to me deeply. And so I pitched it to my theatre company. My pitch line was Erin Brockovich meets Made in Dagenham starring the Pink Ladies. And my company loved it. So we applied to America for the rights to put the play on. And the answer came back, no, no, you can't put the play on. Well, I would not take no for an answer because already I felt passionately about these women and I knew I needed to tell this story. So I phoned the agent in America and essentially begged to be allowed to put the play on. Luckily, he relented. And the moment I got that yes, I started researching because I knew the play was based on a true story and I wanted to do justice to the people that my actors and I were portraying on stage. And so I read everything that I could find on the women. There were two other books about them, one on their legal legacy and another about the science of their story. But very quickly, I discovered that the book I wanted to read, which would tell me and my actors about the women's weddings and what they were like as people and their personal journeys and experiences, very quickly, I realized that book did not exist. There was no book that put the women center stage and allowed them to have a voice. And I thought the women deserved such a book. And eventually I thought, well, if no one else has done it, why don't I? And it wasn't an easy decision to make because as you can tell from this description so far, this is a story that's full of law and it's full of science and history. And I'm not a historian and I'm not a scientist and I'm not a lawyer. But in the end, I thought, well, what I am is a woman 
And perhaps what the Radium girls need is not another lawyer or doctor or historian speaking for them. Perhaps all they need is just an ordinary woman, like they were ordinary women, who can look at their story and see the humanity in it. Who will think of them as people and not, as I found in the research file, I will never think of them as fresh bones, which is how they were described by one of the doctors who studied them. I pitched my book and I got a deal and I came to America to research it. And that was essential to me because I wanted to bring the women's world to life in the book. I wanted to walk the streets that they had. I wanted to visit their homes and their graves and the sites of the dial painting studios. Primarily, however, on that research trip, I was trying to find the women's own records that they may have left behind. Stunningly, I uncovered their own words through letters, diaries, through newspaper interviews and trial transcripts. The Radium Girls had left their own record behind in their own words. And I hope if you read the book, it is to hear from the Radium Girls themselves, because their first person quotations are scattered throughout the narrative. And I feel very strongly that even though my name is on the book cover, it's not my book, it's their book. This is their story. And if you read it, you will hear from them. You'll hear from Grace Fryer and Catherine Donahue and Catherine Sharp about exactly what they went through, exactly what it was like to be a Radium Girl. And they'll take you on that journey, that joy of getting this seemingly fabulous job through the worry of that first aching tooth, through to the horror of the fatal diagnosis and through to that incredible and awe-inspiring fight for justice in which the women literally use their last breaths to try to hold these companies to account. Catherine Donahue literally gave evidence on her deathbed because she was so determined to hold the companies to account. Perhaps the most moving experience in my entire research trip came via Catherine Donahue. I had heard on the grapevine that this small museum in Illinois might hold some Radium Girls material. So I bounded through the door full of enthusiasm to find out what they had, and I asked to see their archive. And the docent looked at me and she said, well, I'll show you what we have happily, uh, but I don't know how helpful you're going to find it. And she walked me over to a display cabinet and there was a photograph of the girls at work in their studio and a copy of the book on their legal legacy. And that was it. And I said, are you sure you don't have anything else? She said, no, this, this is everything. And I was terribly British and polite. And I said, well, would you mind asking your manager, please? So she did. We went over to see the manager, who was an older gentleman with snowy white hair. And he kind of scratched his head when I asked and he said, oh, we might have something in the back. Feel free to take a look. So I went into the back room of this small museum and I started going through uh, the files that they had. I lifted this dusty folder off the shelf and started going through it. And in that dusty folder, in that back room of this tiny museum in Illinois, I found handwritten letters between Catherine Donahue and Pearl Payne. And I can't tell you the power of that moment because I had met these women through a play. I had directed actresses to portray them on stage. And now here I am sitting and holding their letters in my hands, touching the paper that they had touched. I was able to trace the signature that Catherine had made with her pencil and feel the indentation that she had left behind. It was a truly extraordinary and spine tingling moment and really brought home to me the reality of this story. Catherine's words were incredibly moving. She talked about the pain that she was in, the loneliness as she was treated in hospital away from her family. And she spoke about her worries for that family too, the fear of how her children would cope without her. And that was the final element of my research, to reach out to those family members. The book is dedicated to the dial painters and those who loved them. And this was the part of the story I wanted to be sure to represent too, to represent those husbands who had to bury their wives.
to represent those children who had to grow up without their moms and to care about those parents who buried not just one daughter, but two or three or four. And so I reached out to the women's families. Universally, they all wanted this story to be told. And they were generous in what they shared with me, opening up their hearts and their homes, sharing their family scrapbooks and albums and telling me about what these women were like. And I wanted to know everything, their hobbies, the sound of their voices. I wanted to know who was always late, who was the life and soul of the party. And the relatives brought these women back to life for me. They shared with me all of their memories. And I spoke to sisters and to sons and daughters and nieces and nephews. Perhaps the most moving interviews for me were those with Catherine Dunahue's niece and nephew. And they were able to take me into her sick room. They described it for me the way that she liked to have the shades drawn so the room was dark. But her nephew, James, said that even though the room was dark, there was a light inside it from Catherine herself. Because the radium with which she had once made watches and clocks glow in the dark was in her skeleton. And James said, he remembered seeing every bone in her body glowing from the radium. I spoke to her niece Mary as well, wanting her to conjure for me the sights and smells and sounds of this sick room. And knowing the pain that Catherine was in, I asked, did she ever cry out with the pain? Mary closed her eyes as she answered me. And I could tell she wasn't with me in her sitting room anymore. She had gone back 70 years in the past and she was with her aunt in that front room with the shades drawn. She took a long time to answer. But eventually she shook her head and she said no. She said she didn't have the energy to scream. All she could do was moan. She was just moaning, moaning. I think what I'm proudest of in my book is that even though Catherine lost her voice in the end, through my book she speaks again and you can hear her. You can hear from all the Radium girls. You can hear about their suffering but also about their strength and their dignity and their courage, because it is an extraordinary legacy they've left us, but it was such an extraordinarily hard journey that they had to leave that gift for us all. So I want to conclude this talk by saying thank you for listening to them. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you, Kate, that was just really, an excellent, excellent talk and just puts faces and names and families behind these really sobering personal stories. You know, just really a wonderful contribution. And I think, you know, we often, we teach it in class, you know, you just talk about the radium girls or you hear about them, but there is so little that, you know, really is known and it's a wonderful, really a, a wonderful contribution that you've made and thank all of their their legacy is is really thank you. I, I think you're right as you said I, I'm so thrilled when people tell me that they teach it because a lot of people have said oh my god how did I not know about this but you're right that often when it is taught and those people that had heard of the story before they only know it as the radium girls and it's this sort of anonymous moniker and the individual women have sort of been lost to history and and the record and obviously I hope that my book redresses the balance somewhat so that people can get to know them as individuals again. Right. And just, I think to the historical context, you know, of the time and why the views were as they were of, of radium and also why the girls would be, you know, just so excited about it all and contributing to the war effort and all of these things. We see that playing out many times. <laughs> um, so yeah. that, that's really a remarkable thing as well. Yeah.
So let me just see if we have any questions. I think lots of people just chiming in saying that it was a wonderful talk and thank you <laughs> thank for you. this. This was a riveting and emotional talk. Thank you for your dedication to their stories. When you spoke with the niece and nephew, had they or other family members suffered any medical impacts from being exposed to the radium in Catherine or whoever their you know, family member was? Yeah. Yes, they have. And, and I mentioned about these scientific studies on the women that, that ran for decades. Actually, Catherine's daughter contributed to that as well because she suffered a lot throughout her life. She had sort of very stunted growth, was very small. Uh, you know, her family members said it was remarkable. She was able to hold down a job. And Mary Jane, her daughter, was absolutely convinced that her mother's radium poisoning, you know, was the reason for her, her stunted growth and, and the various different ailments that she had. And she actually died relatively young, apparently from a heart condition, but she died relatively young, as did her brother. Her brother died, I think he was 30, from a type of cancer. So there certainly was belief that those children were affected because it's important to say that Catherine was actually quite far on in her radium poisoning at the time she was carrying her children and so some of the obstetricians that I've talked to have said that it's probable that perhaps the radium in Catherine's body might have crossed the placenta and damaged the children I mean I'm not a doctor I can't I can't speak to that but certainly the the children do seem to have been affected and there were other examples in the files that I found so for example there was a dial painter and a sister who were written about from New Jersey and the sister was not a dial painter. They shared a bed. And the sister who was not a dial painter died of radium poisoning because her sister would come home covered with radioactive dust and obviously transferred in the home as well. So yes, there were, you know, tragically stories in the archives and in the records of family members being hurt. What I find quite interesting is it wasn't every family member. So I mentioned being able to speak to sons and daughters Actually, some sons and daughters, you know, lived into their 80s and 90s, despite having a parent who had, you know, died of radium poisoning. And as far as I could tell, again, not being a scientist, it seemed to determine, you know, it, whether the children were hurt or not seemed to depend on how sick the mothers were at the time they were just dating the children. And I presume it's because radium poisoning is so insidious and takes such a long time to sort of have these damaging effects that perhaps if you had your children early on, they were okay and yet the ones such as Catherine Dunahue who had their children a little bit later in life those children did seem to be affected hmm, yes and I'm sure to just susceptibility you know of some some individuals but yeah, yes it's very yeah tragic. I seem to recall reading somewhere that even their graves you know that people have, you go to the graves with Geiger counters and they still are just even there just so radioactive it's it's hard to imagine Yes. Yeah, that's true. I, I didn't do it myself, but that is reportedly what happens if you go with a Geiger counter, it, it will go off. Um, interesting, they, because of the scientific studies, they did exhume some of the women if they got permission from the families. And those women were reburied in lead caskets to try to stop radioactivity coming off the skeletons, which, as you say, just cannot be a good thing uh, buried in the ground. Right, right. Well, let's see. Let's take another question here. Looking at lead-based products and asbestos, PCBs, radium with history, seemingly repeating itself time and time again, do you have any suggestions on how we might balance technological advancement with worker safety moving forward? I mean, it's hard. I mean, I think, I think the Manhattan Project story that I mentioned in the talk, that's one way of doing it, isn't it? To sort of be aware of, you know, are there any similarities with, you know, when new materials and things are being handled, can we study them to see if anything we already know about is going to have an impact to guide us on this? You know, so, I, you know, I mentioned, you know, the, the safety standards that were put in place for the Manhattan Project workers were based directly on the knowledge gained from the radium girls' bodies of what was a safe level of exposure. So I think, you know, trying to learn the lessons from the past, you know, think is, are there ways of learning when we are handling a new substance? Is there anything it's like is an important step. And I think obviously listening to whistleblowers as well, you know, that's often the problem is it, it takes too long for the truth to come out. You know, that often the truth, you know, we might not know it at first, but it becomes clear as time progresses and someone might whistleblow on it, but the companies will try and cover it up, for example, again, usually because of financial you know concerns and it's that sort of thing you know being being open to listen to whistleblowers and to give them support 
so that the truth can come to light, I think is important. Yes. And did one other question was, did the companies ever provide any compensation after the truth came out about what happened to the, the women, the girls? Very, 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 very limited is the answer. Very, 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 very limited. There were a handful of large settlements, but most women got nothing. And those that did get something, it was usually very, 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 very small. So, I mean, small to the point of, you know, I mean, I mentioned the $43.75, you know, that's really quite shocking. Um, yes, it is. The amount that some people received and most women got nothing. Yeah. There's a question about, did, were the houses them, where they lived ever decontaminated or, you know, any follow-up in the dwellings where they that's, lived? That's a really important question. And, and one point I want to make is that in New Jersey, there were, I mentioned that there were laboratories as well. So they were refining radium from the ore and apparently an offshoot sort of product from this refining process was a substance that looked like sand, like, you know, like, like seaside sand, but it was radioactive. The company with its entrepreneurial hat on sold this sand to the local council and who used it for landfill. So actually, it's not just the houses that the women lived in that became ra radioactive. All these houses in New Jersey that were built on this radioactive landfill that came from the radium company laboratories all of them were radioactive as well and of course the buildings in which the studios were located as well were also contaminated and um, so yes there was a cleanup process but it wasn't for decades it was sort of the 1980s 1990s that it began and it's still going on to this day in Ottawa for example where I've visited many times now the cleanup operation is still continuing because these you know, these residences and these communities were contaminated. And you can see that in, you know, higher cancer rates than normal, so on and so forth. You know, it, it's demonstrably evident that it, there is a problem. And that's why there were these EPA super fund cleanup sites. So yeah, that cleanup is still happening. Has anyone uh, checked the handwritten letters for radioactivity? Uh, not that I know of and people have said as I put this in my talk people say well, my god you were able to touch them with your hands are you not worried I mean I wasn't worried at all at, at the time which is probably naive of me to my knowledge I don't think anyone's tested them but what's a kind of nice after story is obviously I found those you know letters in a back room well since my books come out and people have appreciated the story and I obviously credit the museum and my notes and so on so it's driven lots more people to go and visit there is now a display at that museum, which is not just uh, the picture in the book in the display cabinet. There's a whole room dedicated to the Radium Girls. And there are copies of the letters that readers can go and read and visit, but they don't have the originals out for you to touch, understandably. I don't know how radioactive they would be. You know, people on this call probably know more than me, but it wasn't like, you know, Madame Curie's records, which are obviously horrendously radioactive and yeah, I, I wasn't worried about it. And as I say, you can't now touch them. And I, I actually feel blessed that I was able to because of my connection with the women and hopefully there'll be no uh, ill effects as a result. Yes, yeah, so somebody asked about Marie Curie too. Mm. She must have been aware of, of this or was she? Do you know any connection there? Yeah, sure. I touch on her a, a tiny bit in, in the book. She came to America a couple of times during the period in which I'm writing. And she was also, she was here on a visit. It, well, I say here, she was in America on a visit while one of the court cases was going on. And so, you know, the press were up in arms at this, you know, travesty of justice, these, you know, beautiful young women who had been poisoned by their companies. And so she was asked, you know, is there anything that you could do to help them? And she you know, said, unfortunately, no, you know, if the, if the radium is in their bodies, there's, there's no way we can get it out. But she was asked about their cases when she came to America, but was not any more involved than that. Yes. Yeah. Well, I think we're about out of, of time here, Kate. There's lots of comments just, you know, thanking you for this fantastic talk and uh, lots of people that have read your book. I certainly hope we can meet one day and I'll have you sign mine. <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> that would just be wonderful. But yeah. we do, one person is asking uh, Manuela, who actually lives in New Jersey. I think she was also in some of our correspondence, you know, very, so she, she's very familiar with this. Um, she says hello, but also wondering what your next project might be. What are you working on now? 
Well, very exciting. I have a new book coming out in June this year. So thank you for asking. It's called The Woman They Could Not Silence. I think that people that like Radium Girls will find a lot to enjoy in it, but it's a completely different story. So it's set in 1860, the cusp of the American Civil War. And it starts with a simple question. What would happen if your husband could commit you to an insane asylum just because you disagreed with him? Oh, my. The starting (laughs) premise. uh, And it's the story of a completely remarkable woman um, who, again, changed the world um, through this sort of crucible of suffering, being called crazy when she wasn't, and how she rises above that and goes into battle, basically, uh, for all womankind. It's a truly amazing story with lots of, you know, twists of gothic horror as I take you inside the insane asylums of the 19th century. So I hope people will enjoy it. Well, excellent. Well, thank you again, Kate, and for really bringing the Radium Girls to life for all of us. Thank you very much for that. My Um, privilege. Thank you. Yes. And I will also mention that, in fact, uh, the recording will be available to those who have registered um, in about seven to 10 days. And also, Kate, if you want to stay on for a little while and look at any of the questions and answers or chat comments that were made that we weren't able to get to today. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. It's my pleasure to talk to you about these wonderful women. Thank you for the opportunity. It's been a joy. Thank you so much. Cassandra, did you have some closing comments? Uh, You did great. You touched on some of mine. As Dr. Bailey mentioned, the recording will be available and emailed to all registrants. And a big thanks to Kate and Dr. Bailey for your time and informative presentation. And thank you for the history committee for making this webinar possible. Thank you. Um, Look forward to Dr. Doug Borum presenting his work on Sonolab later this month. But yeah, we can stay on for a little bit here and continue the conversation for anyone that would like to stay on as well, if you'd like. But it sounds, it sounds like there's lots of people working to bring these radium girls back to life still, so. Well, and to learn from them, you know, because I mean, as I say, the gift they've given us is absolutely extraordinary. And, you know, I, I think really the studies did end perhaps a little bit prematurely. I think it was the early 1990s when they shut them down. And as people have said in the chat, there is more to be learned. So, you know, that's, that's a good thing if, uh, if, they, if the gift continues, isn't it? You know, because at yeah. least at least then in a way, you know, the sacrifice meant something. Uh, you know, it's protected so many other people. Yeah, from and a lot of different things. You know, that was brought out in one of the questions. You know, it's, it's kind of, the, it, it's the same story, a different agent or a different something that, that's harming employees. So it's, it really is important for us to remember these lessons. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, ladies. We'll close here at exactly an hour and appreciate your time. We'll follow up shortly. Thank you. Thank Thank you so much. Thank you again. And it's lovely to to see you in person, Dr. Bailey and uh, everyone remotely. Thank you for the lovely comments and for tuning in. Yes. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.